a Palm Sunday hymn and one of the hymns that we sang at Judy's funeral. So many things bring me back to that. Please take your Bibles and turn to our passage today in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 through 20. The message is entitled, Why a Donkey and Not a Horse? Why a Donkey and Not a Horse? When Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, which we call the Triumphal Entry so many years ago, Why a Donkey and Not a Horse? You recall that two years ago I told you a true story. I'd like to repeat it again because it has a direct bearing on that message out of Deuteronomy chapter 17. You recall what we read in verse 16, but he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and its power. We pray that you will help us to understand the reason why Jesus on his first coming rode the donkey and not the horse. And Father, we pray that you will help us to understand how it practically applies to us today in the way in which we approach the world around us, the message that we have to bring, the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you again for this Palm Sunday. We pray for your word that it will go forth clearly and with power this day, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And out of that story that I shared two years ago with you all here, at one point the world was in a state of turmoil. November 24, 1859, Darwin had just released his work on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. That entire 1859 edition of 1,250 copies was exhausted on the day of issue. And the war for the souls of men was declared in earnest by the hordes of evolutionary Huns and Visigoths. Slightly more than a year later, on April 12, 1861, Confederate forces fired on Fort Sumter and the United States was launched into a vicious war over both the souls and bodies of men. But in that same year, in 1861, in the quiet rural setting of Suffolk, England, a baby was born with a rather large name, Edmund Henry Hinman Allenby. And as he grew, young Edmund excelled in academics, physical exercise, spiritual pursuits, and became a very earnest Christian. But his chief interest was in the military. By the time that World War I had broken out, Edmund was assigned to lead the British forces in Egypt and in Palestine. By skillfully combining attacks by his own forces with those of Arab guerrillas led by Major T.E. Lawrence, most of you know him as Lawrence of Arabia, he defeated the Turks in 1917 and 1918, first at Beersheba, or Beersheba it looks like to us, but Beersheba, where my son Philemon studied and earned an MD in international health and medicine. And then as he moved north through the land of Israel at the decisive Battle of Megiddo on September 18, 1918, which placed the entire land of Israel into the hands of the British. Ten months earlier, in November of 1917, the British government had issued one of the most astounding documents in history. After 2,000 years in exile, the Balfour Declaration set forth the proposition that the Jews should once again be given a national homeland in their own land of Israel. One month after that declaration, in December of 1917, the city of Jerusalem fell to the British forces of Edmund Henry Hinman Allenby, by that time known as Lord Allenby. The Jaffa Gate, and I used to live just about 400 yards from the Jaffa Gate, the Jaffa Gate on the west side of Jerusalem had been blown open. Lord Allenby, riding a powerful military horse at the head of his marching troops, advanced to the gate to accept the surrender of the city. And then a most amazing thing happened. As he approached the gate, 
Allenby refused to parade in as a conquering hero. Instead, he dismounted and quietly walked through the gate on foot to accept the surrender of the Turks. Not only the Muslim Turks, but also his own British troops were astonished. This was not accepted military protocol for a conquering hero. When questioned as to why he acted as he did, Lord Allenby replied, only one conquering hero should ever ride his horse in triumph into Jerusalem. And that one is my Lord, Jesus Christ. That man was a true believer. But when Jesus Christ came the first time, he rode a donkey, not a majestic stallion. The message today is entitled, Why a Donkey and Not a Horse? The text that we've just read is Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20. You know, we speak of Palm Sunday as a triumphal entry. But why do we speak of it as a triumphal entry since it led to the cross? The first trip ended in rejection, not in a crown. So in what sense was this a triumphal entry? For our glory, conquering heroes ride horses, not donkeys. But Palm Sunday is only the first of two triumphal entries that refer to our Lord Jesus Christ. The first was made 2,000 years ago as he rode into the city of Jerusalem on an ass, the foal of an ass. And the prophecy that Zechariah had made 550 years earlier was fulfilled to the letter by our Lord. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. We need to notice several, th several things out of that particular passage. This first official entry was indeed the entry of a king. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Even at his first coming, Jesus Christ was, in fact, the king. But the first coming was to be marked by three things that are stated for us in that passage in Zechariah. The first thing that is noticed, it was to be injustice. He is just. The second thing that the passage states about this king is salvation. And having salvation. The third thing that it states about him is his humility. Lowly and riding upon an ass. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. Three things about that king as he came into the city. The first quality is justice. That's seen in his deliberate fulfillment of the law at his first coming. Justice requires the payment of a penalty for crimes committed. In our case, the criminal offense was sin against a holy God. Justice is righteous and righteousness. The just one is the righteous one. Here the king must fulfill the law and see that justice and righteousness are done. It is not only his obligation, it is his character. Secondly, there can be no salvation, the second mark of his first coming, if it's not in harmony with justice. There can be no salvation if it is not in harmony with justice. We had sinned and offended the holiness of God. A penalty had to be paid. The king himself had come to pay the penalty and to set his people free from the weight of the law that was looming over them and condemning them. Salvation, deliverance, was what he would accomplish 
but by fulfilling the just demands of the law. The wages of sin is death. Justice demanded it. The penalty had to be paid in full if we were to be saved from the wrath of God. The king came to see that justice was done so that we might receive salvation. The third mark of his first coming listed for us by Zechariah was his humility, the lowliness that Zechariah mentions. In fact, this is the mark that Zechariah emphasizes. The astounding thing about the first coming of the king was that it was marked by humility. The Lord of heaven left pristine purity and beauty and holiness and splendor to penetrate the squalid conditions of earth taking on a woman born body of one of his creatures sinful man the way Zechariah emphasizes this humility and it is the emphasis of that verse in verse 9 is by stating clearly that Jesus would ride a donkey into Jerusalem proving that the king was so humble that he would not come as a conqueror at his first appearing, but as the penalty bearer of sin to satisfy justice so that he could save wretched sinners who deserved hell. As we look at the four Gospels, we discover something very interesting. As you know, three of the Gospels are called Synoptic Gospels. That is, they record many of the same events, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And John records a completely separate set of events. He has seven special signs that he gives, many of which are not recorded in the other Gospels. And so he doesn't always include everything, and the other Gospels don't always include everything that are found in those two sets of portrayals of Christ. But the triumphal entry is found in all four of the Gospels. Only Matthew and John cite Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 as the direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Palm Sunday. But all four writers mention the colt or the foal upon which Jesus rode. I'm going to read those for you and I want you to notice what an incredible amount of text God chose to give to this very important occasion, not only in the history of Israel, but in the history of the world. We begin with John chapter 12, and in verse 12 it says, On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, Hoshienu, save us. Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord, an acknowledgment of who he was. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, and here's the quotation from Zechariah chapter 9, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. The raising of Lazarus had a specific purpose it was to produce the effect that we call Palm Sunday. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how the, ye prevail nothing, behold, the world is gone after him. Now we move to Matthew chapter 21. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, Bethphage, the house of figs. We'll talk about that in a moment saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. 
Did it ever occur to you that Jesus needed anything? The Lord hath need of them. He needed sleep. He needed food. There are many things that our Lord needed if you read through the Gospels and see him in his humanity. Here he needed something that he might fulfill a specific prophecy made 550 years earlier. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David! They recognized his lineage from the king, who was the great king of Israel. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, quoting another of the Messianic Psalms, Psalm 118. Hosanna in the highest! And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. There are many churches today that could be called dens of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. The triumphal entry ended with some very interesting healings. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. <laughs> Little children weren't just with him coming down the mountain and across the valley and up to the gate of the temple. They were singing his praises in the temple, according to this. And he said, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? And he left them and went out of the city into Bethany, and he lodged there. We learn more from the Gospel of Mark. When they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. And saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him, and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without, in a place where two ways met, and they loose him. And certain of them that stood there said unto them, what do ye loosing the colt? Now some of you have automobiles. I think all of you do. And if you are standing, say outside a store talking, and somebody comes up and opens the door to your car and gets into it, do you think you would challenge them? <laughs> I think you would. That's what's happening here. There are people standing around, and two guys come up, and start untying their donkey. And it's cold. And they say, What do you think you're doing? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, and they let them go. There's a supernatural compulsion here because Jesus had need of that ass. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy nothing would stand in the way. And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him and he sat upon him. And many spread their garments in the way and others cut down branches off the trees and strawed them in the way. And they that went before and they that followed cried saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Direct quotation out of Psalm 118. 
Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple and when he had looked round about upon all things and now the eventide was come, he went out into Bethany with the twelve. One more passage, it's in the Gospel of Luke. And again we find additional things that are being added for us. Each of the Gospel writers supplementing different details so that we have a full picture of what took place at that triumphal entry. And when he had thus spoken, this is Luke 19, verse 28 and following, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never yet man sat. Loose him, bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found, even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come now nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Let me pause for just a moment and say, folks, if you're missing prayer meeting on Wednesday evening, you're missing some very important teaching. Several weeks ago, we heard the tremendous teaching by Ray Vanderland on the series that he's doing on all these different locations in Israel about the triumphal entry and all the significance, the political significance of what was going on and why it was so dangerous, if you will, for the people to be waving palm branches and putting palm branches down in front of Jesus and saying the specific things that they did in a very loud voice. You missed it. I'm not going to tell you what it was. But it's fantastic. Oh, I wish you would have been there. And so they're saying in a very loud voice, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, And here is something new that Luke adds for us. I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The king will be praised. And dear people, today, even today, the stones cry out as archaeologists uncover all these incredible things that are in that land where our Lord walked and where someday he will reign in the city of Jerusalem. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Here again is something that Luke gives to us about that day, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. This was the king offering himself to his people. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God does not look on the outward appearance as man looks, but God looks on the heart. The outward appearance is of a group of people who are accepting their Messiah but they didn't understand why he had come the first time. They were looking for political deliverance. They were looking from, from safety from the iron boot of Rome. They did not understand that the salvation which he offered was not the temporal salvation of national prosperity. The salvation he offered was the eternal salvation of life forever. How often we focus on the wrong things when we come to our Lord in prayer. If thou hadst known even thou at least in this thy day, 
This was your day. This was your opportunity. This was your time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, Paul tells us. In this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. More prophetic word from our Lord Jesus Christ happened in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, surrounded the city of Jerusalem. The Jews could no longer escape. And those that tried to escape swallowed their gold so that it wouldn't be found on them. And the Romans soon caught, soon caught on to that trick. And so when they'd catch a Jew trying to escape from the city, they would immediately slash him open so they could take the gold out of his stomach. Jesus prophesied it here because he knew what was in their hearts. Outside it looked good, and maybe for you it's looking very good on the outside. But what is in your heart? And shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. Think of that, the little children who were singing his praises in the temple. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. The time of our visitation is coming, people. Peter talks about it. It's prophesied. The one who is the shepherd and bishop of our souls, the one who is the overseer of our souls, is going to have a visitation upon his people, the church. Not one stone will be left upon another. And Titus and his troops, in anger, took all the stones of the temple and threw them into the Kidron Valley, into the Tyropean Valley, and leveled the temple platform. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Now I've read those four extended passages to show you how much space God in his word gave to the first triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into Jerusalem. I hope you picked up a few things that I mentioned just in passing that we won't have time to completely cover, but things that related to that first coming of Christ in humility. And his humility, he cast out things that did not belong in the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are there things there that should be cast out? Back to our text for today, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 20. It reminds us of the typology of the kings of Israel in portraying Christ at his first coming. Do you remember that passage? If you want to open back up there to Deuteronomy chapter 17, I'm going to be going through it very quickly so that you can see each of the different things that are listed about the kings. Moses is here giving the law. There are no kings yet in Israel. This is the book of Deuteronomy. There's a long time before Saul and before David. The first thing that Moses stated to Israel was that their king would not be like the kings of the surrounding nations. When you get a king, he says, don't cause him to be a king like the kings around you. The kings around were proud, arrogant. They were horrible characters who, with brutality, kept their people in control. Your king's not to be that way because you see those kings were a foreshadowing and a portrayal of Jesus Christ. We find that Jesus was definitely not like the kings of the surrounding nations. The second key element that we see in that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 17 was that God himself would choose the king. And I think that can surely be said true as a foreshadowing of Christ, the great king. The third thing stated by Moses was the human lineage of the king. Did you catch that? It says it is to be one of their brethren. And the book of Hebrews makes a point out of that. This king had to be Jewish. That is why Jesus was born of a Jewish mother. I think it's fascinating to notice that the fourth thing that Moses states dealt with horses. 
since that's the theme and the question that we look at today. The king was not to multiply horses to himself because horses speak of military power. And the first coming of Christ was to be in humility. You well know that King Solomon violated that command in a most flagrant manner. The fifth requirement, also very interesting, that the king should not multiply wives to himself. At his first coming, Jesus is seen as the bridegroom. But the wedding feast of the Lamb is not yet in view. At his first coming, he had not yet been joined to his bride, the church. He is still calling out his bride, even as we speak. He has not yet come for his bride to catch her up to glory at the rapture. Thus, Jesus at his first coming had no wife. But at his second coming, he will have a bride made up of the millions, truly the multiplied bride, who have trusted in him for salvation, offered by him at his first coming in humility. The sixth statement about the king is that he will sit on the throne with a copy of the law, judging righteously, and will read the law all the days of his life to keep the statutes of the Lord and to do them. That clearly foreshadows our Lord Jesus Christ because the New Testament tells us that Christ will judge the world in perfect righteousness. This sets the stage for the contrast between the coming on a donkey and the coming on a horse. Now we've just read the four gospel narratives that outline his coming on the donkey. When God tells us something once, we're responsible for listening and for learning. But when God tells us something two or three, or four, or five times, God wants us to pay attention. Here's something that God has told us five times, once in prophecy and four times in fulfillment in the Gospels. So why would God make such a point about an animal when our Lord entered the city of Jerusalem at his first coming? And why, as the king, would Jesus go into the temple rather than to the palace of either Herod or Pilate there in Jerusalem if he's the king? Why, instead, would he cast out money changers rather than pagan temporal rulers? Why does John mention the raising of Lazarus from the dead in connection with the entry to Jerusalem? Why does Luke take pains to include the detail of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and prophesying its total destruction in the middle of his triumphal entry? into the city. If he's going to be the king, can he protect his city? To answer those questions, we turn back to the Old Testament where the ass appears as a beast of burden. It's a humble creature, but it's mentioned frequently in connection with some of God's greatest men in Scripture. Just remember, God's greatest men are not always the ones the world considers greatest men. We find the first occurrence in Genesis 22, verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. That's the very first mention of the ass in the Bible. It appears in the context of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac, whom God calls Abraham's only son, a type and picture foreshadowing Christ whom God offered as his only begotten son. In both cases, the ass was going to Mount Moriah, which is the temple mount, to bring the precious sacrifice. I can't prove it, but it would not surprise me if the colt that Jesus rode was a direct descendant of the ass that Abraham took when he went to sacrifice Isaac. We see the ass mentioned again in Genesis 42:27 and 44:13 in the Joseph narrative. 42:27, and as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender at the inn, he espied his money. For behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And then in chapter 44, verse 13, then they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. In both of those two incidences. The brothers of Joseph have gone to Egypt seeking food for their father Jacob and for their families. In the first instance, Joseph has recognized his brothers, but they do not recognize him. He tells his steward to return each man's money in the mouth of his sack. 
In the second instance, after seeing his full brother Benjamin, he tells the steward to put his silver cup in the mouth of Benjamin's sack as a test. Will the brothers abandon Benjamin to his fate or will they return him? Joseph, as you know from our studies in the book of Genesis, is portrayed in scripture as a type and a picture foreshadowing Christ, just like Isaac. But he portrays not the sacrifice like Isaac, instead he portrays the beloved son hated by his brethren, sold for silver just like Christ, turned over to the Gentile world of Egypt just as Christ was turned over to the Gentile Romans. But Joseph came to power over the Gentiles as well as over his brethren, just as Jesus will someday reign over both Jew and Gentile in his millennial kingdom. The ass appears again in Jacob's great prophecy concerning the latter days and what will become of each of Jacob's 12 sons. And the portion that deals with Judah says this, Genesis 49, verse 8 and following, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. The scepter, that's what a king carries, shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver. Remember why Jesus came? What was the first character quality? He is just and having salvation. Thy king comes to you, the lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. An enigmatic prophecy about this coming Messiah. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He shall wash his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white with milk. It's an incredible prophecy. If you were with us in our studies of the book of Genesis, we went into that in detail, but I'll only mention a few of the very important things that we find here. That's the prophecy concerning Judah, the ancestor of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was from the tribe of Judah. Verse 8 prophesies that his Jewish brothers will bow down before him. Verse 10 is clear that Messiah will be a king and a judge. Verse 11 makes the fascinating statement about Messiah binding his foal unto the vine, his ass's colt unto the choice vine. To understand the reference to the foal, the ass's colt, we need to remember what we have studied before. God frequently uses two different plants in the Old Testament to portray Israel the fig tree, and the vine. Here in the immediate context of the triumphal entry, we see the symbolism of the fig tree used of Israel in its rejection of the Messiah, its withering away and its restoration. Matthew 21, 18. Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered, and when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it, and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered? We get to the Mount of Olives discourse in Matthew chapter 24, and Jesus begins to talk about not merely the withering of the fig tree, which has happened, but about the restoration of the fig tree which speaks of Israel. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Next verse. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. May 1948. Israel, a nation born in a day. And it's beginning 
to bud and sprout and put forth its leaves. After 2,000 years of withering, it is suddenly beginning to bud again. All of this is surrounding the narrative of the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus Christ into the city of Jerusalem. The withering, yes, they didn't really accept the Messiah in their hearts. And God sent Titus, the Roman general, to destroy the city. But God had promised them that that nation would come back. No other nation in the history of the world has come back after 2,000 years. And Israel was born in a day. And it's beginning to sprout leaves. At the triumphal entry and immediately afterwards, Jesus portrays Israel as the fig tree in two ways. First, at the point of Israel's rejection at his first coming. Secondly, at the point of their restoration at his second coming. The Jews got the fig tree and the vine confused, just like they got the humility of the first coming and the glory of the second coming confused. Luke puts the fig tree and the vine together in his parable. In Jesus speaking in Luke 13, he spoke also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Interesting, a fig tree in a vineyard. And he came and saw fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. In the context, Jesus is speaking about the coming judgment on Israel because they failed to truly respond to him during his three-year ministry, the fig tree, the vineyard, the donkey, the horse, the types, the prophetic pictures are clear. Now back to that passage in Genesis 49:10. We find the ass is tied to the vine, that is to Israel. But it's tied in the context where it portrays Christ as the victor who will come someday to rule over Jerusalem and from Jerusalem will rule the world. He comes the second time on a white horse in conquest. But he is not only the conqueror, he is still the gracious savior. The ass will then truly be tied to the vine of Israel, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt to the choice vine. He washed his garments in white and his clothes in the blood of grapes. And that's what brings us to the second coming. And that time, he'll be riding a magnificent white stallion and not a donkey. The second coming is in power, not humility. The second coming is in splendor and glory, not in veiled humanity. His clothing at the first coming was stained with his own blood of sacrifice. His clothing at the second coming is stained with the blood of grapes. The blood of grapes is clearly stated in Revel Revelation to be a symbol for the wringing out of the winepress of the earth and speaks of the trampled blood of his enemies splattered upon his garments. The second time his garments are not stained with his own blood, but with the blood of his enemies. That's the portrayal that we see of Jesus at his second coming when he will indeed ride a majestic war horse, not a donkey. Hear the words of Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Remember what Zechariah said about him when he came the first time on the donkey? He is just. That's righteousness. Injustice! He's going to judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. This is a king. And he had the name written, which no man knew but he himself. And listen to verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And oh, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. The Word was God. The first thing we learn of him here is that he is just. His character is still justice, righteousness, holiness, just like we saw at his first coming. But this time he does not come to offer spiritual salvation, only judgment and wrath on those who have rejected his gracious offer. 
This time his salvation is to physically deliver the Jewish people from the great tribulation that's going on and then to fulfill the promised millennial kingdom. This second time he does not come in lowliness, he comes in intense glory. The second time he does not come in humility on a donkey, he comes as a furious warrior king ablaze with holy wrath against sinners. Someday, according to Revelation 19, Jesus will return as the conquering king, riding a white military charger, not an ass, as he returns in victory to reign. The donkey was a sign of humility strictly appropriate for the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The white war horse is a sign of power and authority, strictly appropriate for the second coming of Christ the King. But the Old Testament tells us more about the ass. It was an unclean animal that had to be redeemed or have its life purchased with a sacrifice. Every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with the land, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children thou shalt redeem. Exodus 34, but the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou redeem him not, then thou shalt break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons shalt thou redeem, and none shall appear before me empty. God tells us that twice about the ass, so we won't miss it. The ass is compared to the firstborn child that had to be redeemed. It was a picture of the need that each of us has for redemption by the Lamb of God. We were unclean with sin just as the ass is an unclean animal. But the Lord chose to use an ass and it was sanctified by his use. He chooses to use us and we are sanctified by his choice and by his use. There's one other thing that we need to notice before we close. There's another connection between the blood of the grape and the reference to another vine as we saw them connected in both Jacob's prophecy and in Revelation chapter 19. Just a few days following the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, Jesus sat with his disciples at the Passover, partaking of what we call the Last Supper. It was there that he told them that he himself was the true vine. Remember that symbolism in relation to Israel? It was there that he gave them the fruit of the vine, the cup that speaks of his blood by which to remember him. That's why even today we celebrate the Lord's table. At his first coming, Christ, even though he was the king, in fact, came in righteousness and humility offering salvation. The ass portrays for us that humility. Remember the second half of Zechariah 9, 9, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, he is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon the colt, the foal of an ass. His humility meant that he required himself to be subject to the prophetic scriptures. His humility meant that he fully identified with us in all points, tempted like we are, yet without sin. His humility meant that he subjected himself to the hatred and cruel hands of rebellious sinners. But perhaps most importantly, we see our Lord Jesus Christ chooses to use humble instruments like the little donkey to fulfill his purposes. Throughout the gospel, he's used humble instruments, small barley loaves, small fishes. Twice he used a small scourge of cords. He used water at a well to draw a woman to eternal life. He used times of rest with the disciples to teach them. He used the disciples' boat. He used a miraculous catch of fishes and a broken net to display his power. As a sovereign incarnate God, he used iron nails and a wooden cross. He used a borrowed tomb. But our Lord still uses humble instruments today. He uses flesh and blood. He has chosen to work through people. Through you. He's chosen to work through the foolishness of preaching, through humble service as the members of the body minister one to another. He's chosen to work through godly living by faith as a testimony to the depraved world around us. Jesus could have chosen a more glorious way and someday at his second coming, he will manifest his glory. But today he has chosen to limit the communication of his truth by placing it into the hands 
of feeble men and women, and yes, even little boys and girls. And amazingly, the book of Hebrews tells us that he is not ashamed to call us brethren. We marvel as we read what Paul wrote to the Corinthians. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, like that little donkey, and like you, and like me, to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world. And the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus. Oh, what a magnificent statement. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. But as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. The ass was a lowly creature that was valuable only in life, but worthless in death. It could not be eaten. Its carcass could not be used for holy things. It was unclean. It was the sign of a curse in the eyes of men as seen with the prophecy against King Jehoiakim in Jeremiah. Chapter 22, verse 18. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, oh, my brother, or Ah, oh, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, oh, Lord, or Ah, oh, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. And yet God chose to use the most lowly of creatures to bear the Lord of glory into Jerusalem as he offered salvation and blessing at his first coming. Never despise the day of small things. Never despise the weak vessels that God chooses to use. It's dangerous. Remember what happened to Balaam cursing the donkey that he rode, and yet the donkey saved his life. When you read over the Palm Sunday narrative, don't pass over the ass and the foal of the ass, but also don't forget that at the second coming, our Lord Jesus Christ will be riding a magnificent white war horse. But for the time being, God still uses little donkeys like you and me in a wonderful and personal way when we're willing to submit to his lordship, when we're willing to let him direct our paths. But that humble lamb of God is also the victorious lion of the tribe of Judah. And someday he will come again and make a second triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem as the king of kings, as the lord of lords. He will ride the white stallion as the victor over his enemies and the king who destroys all those who oppose him. And we will be riding in his train. Remember we saw him riding that white horse, sitting on it, being called faithful and true, in righteousness, judging and making war, clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God, and then we read the following verses. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's you. That's me. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, Psalm 2 quotation. And he treadeth the winepress, oh, there we are back again, of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Perhaps now you understand why General Allenby dismounted his horse and walked into Jerusalem. Perhaps now you understand why he said only one conquering hero should ever ride his horse in triumph into Jerusalem. 
And that one is my Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. Oh, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. The king who indeed was king at his first coming, though he came in humility, offering salvation. The one who is just. The one who at his second coming will still be just, but for those who have rejected the salvation that he so humbly offered, they will see him riding the white war horse of judgment. And we will be following in his train. Father, help us even now, as we are weak and helpless vessels, no power of our own, but those who can be used by the Lord of glory. When you untie the colt, if someone asks you why you're doing it, just say to him, the Lord has need of him. You could do it without our help, and certainly you are the God who made everything. But you choose to use people. Men and women and boys and girls, those who are committed to you, you use us when we are willing, though we are unclean animals, when we are willing to submit to you as our king. Thank you, Father, again for your word. We pray for your blessings upon it this day, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 225, Come Christians Join to Sing. Let's stand to sing number 200.